everyone. Uh, this is Tom Connolly, President and Chief Investment Officer of Versant Capital Management, Inc. Uh, today, we're having a brief video session on the uh, geopolitical impact of the events in the Ukraine here on uh, our investments in general and some of the things that we're doing for our clients. Uh, normally, uh, or actually it's more uh, scheduled, was today was going to be a session on more generally on the impact of geopolitical events on investments, but the uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine has uh, uh, prompted us to make this session more specific to that topic. So that's what we're going to do today. And there have been uh, recent developments make uh, my notes change day to day for this uh, meeting. So I um, uh, will try to inc incorporate some of the things I've heard uh, today to bring us uh, up to date on, on everything. So uh, Russia has invaded uh, the Ukraine. Um, in our opinion, it most resembles some of the events of the late 1930s, uh, more specifically when Hitler undertook a bloodless absorption of Austria in 1938. Uh, it was called Anschluss. Uh, and the, they also, in 1938, forced, forced Czechoslovakia to cede uh, the Sudetenland, which uh, had a lot of uh, folks of German ancestry in it. A uh, very similar argument to what Putin did in the Ukraine with the uh, provinces in uh, eastern Ukraine that had a lot of ethnic Russians, where they are uh, trying to extract those provinces uh, in much the same way from the Ukraine as Hitler did uh, uh, parts of Czechoslovakia into Germany in 1938. Um, the one interesting thing about the, what's going on today is Putin's behaving very much like a throwback in states into a uh, nation, which we now know as Italy. And later on in the 1800s, Bismarck, uh, through a number of conflicts culminating in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, united a lot of the German states, uh, uh, Prussia, Bavaria, among them, into a cohesive Germany in uh, 1870. And um, Putin is behaving in a similar way, trying to reassemble uh, the parts of the Soviet Union that became independent after 1990. And um, he's also already kind of brought Georgia back into the fold. Uh, you can see from the events of today with the Ukraine that Belarus is a, basically a vassal state of the Soviet Union. Um, and I think the end game for Putin is he's trying to accomplish that same thing with the Ukraine. Uh, so, um, in terms of what that looks like for investments in the rest of the world, first let's frame things in perspective. Uh, the Russian economy is 1.9% of global GDP. So it's a, almost an insignificant number. Um, that would place uh, Russian GDP as approximately the same as South Korea. So you have... Um, a uh, uh, think of South Korea, a country the size of South Korea in terms of economic production, challenging the whole of Europe backed by America is kind of an interesting thing. Um, and then the Ukra Ukrainian GDP is about 0.18% of global GDP, almost a rounding error. Another thing to remember here is behind the scenes, Russian demographics are horrific. They um, they, their life expectancy is much lower for a, a male than uh, in the rest of Europe, developed Europe. Um, they have real problems with alcoholism. A HIV is still big there, depression. Um, so life expectancy is much lower and their birth rate is extremely low. Um, if things continue as they are now, Russia, Russians are in the process of going extinct. So in terms of a long-term threat of Russians being able to project force um, or economic power, uh, their prospects in the long and medium run are very th not very good unless they change internally. Uh, as far as economic power goes, the bulk of Russian exports are oil and gas and other commodities. The uh, economy is remarkably undiversified. In the current setting, uh, the 
current order of battle in the Ukraine for the Russians is a fraction of what uh, of the forces that ranged across the battlefields in World War II. In the Cold War, in the 1970s and 80s, when we, the uh, NATO forces were eyeball to eyeball across the Iron Curtain from the uh, Soviet troops, um, again, you had millions of troops on each side of that border eyeing each other. And um, the Russians are going into the Ukraine today, the largest country in Europe, um, with with a tenth, less than a tenth of the forces that were on the border back then. So it kind of tells you, is it indicative of what the outcome might be? The Russians cannot overrun and hold the Ukraine with 200,000 troops. Um, that's uh, too little to do the job and to hold the country. Uh, remember that we couldn't hold Vietnam with five or 600,000 troops. I mean, we couldn't hold half of Vietnam with five or 600,000 troops in the, in the 60s. Um, so uh, also, uh, I'm going to get back to more of more of the Russian economic relative economic numbers in a minute. But um, I want to talk a little bit about the response of markets to crisis. Um, if you go back uh, into the 70s and look at things like the Arab-Israeli War, um, the first Gulf War, the initial responses to a lot of these conflicts were market declines, and they generally ranged from um, a 2% decline in the market associated with the Arab Spring in 2011, uh, all the way up to a 17% decline with the Arab-Israeli War in October of 73. So those are sizable declines. Uh, the, the decline we've had in the last few days around these events is, is similar. Um, uh, bef before the rebound, uh, the U.S. was in correction territory, but one could argue that a lot of these market declines in Europe and invasion. If, you, if we pan out a little, instead of looking right around the start of this event, what were market returns around times when we actually had troops engaged for extended periods, U.S. troops? Here we obviously have no U.S. troops, but what were returns over the span of larger conflicts? Um, it's quite interesting. So in World War One, from 1914 to to uh, 1918, um, the stock market, the broad U.S. stock market, returned about 1.12% a year, which is far from negative. Um, and in the Korean War, from 1950 to 53, uh, the number was over 16% per year, uh, the stock market, and despite the fact that we were engaged in a war, not just with Korea, but China, who, uh, who backed the Koreans with their own troops. We backed the Koreans with our troops. Um, but the market... Um, was up 16% a year. In World War II, arguably the largest conflict uh, by far, markets were up over 22% a year from 1941 to 1945. So that includes Pearl Harbor. Um, and then one specific event, which is a little similar to what's going on today, Hitler's invasion of Poland in 1939, which started World War II. Uh, market was actually up that year over 12%. So market declines, you know, these events, there might be an initial decline, but over the, the long run span of some of these events, market returns are typically positive. So the, the events can be momentous um, and are certainly from a geopolitical aspect, this event is momentous and the ethical, moral considerations are, are very, very significant. But from the perspective of investments and economics, it's really probably not that big a deal. Um, I mentioned before how uh, small the Russian economy was um, in relation to uh, the world. Um, it has significant economic activity, interactivity with Europe and its neighbors. Um, however, uh, the, and Russian bonds were marked zero for collateral purposes. <clears throat> excuse me, for many, in many international banks because the sanctions wouldn't allow uh, them to transact. In, um, in our client portfolios, uh, we believe as a, as a start, we invest in stocks and bonds around the world as a first approximation. Um, so the uh, 
emerging market exposure, which invests uh, across all the emerging market uh, bonds in, in our client portfolios, is offered by Vanguard, and its exposure to Russia is 3.4%. And the emerging market stock exposures we have range from less than a percent to less than a percent and a half invested in Russia. And if you back zoom out from there and say, okay, well, those are just those individual investments. How much does our whole portfolio have in Russian investments? The answer is less than a third of a percent. So the impact to uh, our clients' investments is from this directly uh, from Russian investments is small. Now, there might be impacts in Europe and some other areas in the short run, um, but we're not terribly uh, concerned about that. Um, some other facts that place this in context um, are that Europe imports 30% of their natural gas uh, from, from Russia, um, and uh, they import a significant amount of their oil as well. Uh, and there are other commodities that are important, um, such as aluminum, oil. Uh, Russia produces about 10% um, of the world's oil, which is a very significant amount, and a large, uh, they consume about half of it. And uh, they provide Europe with about 30% of their needs. Um, so there's there's a significant link in energy, oil, and both gas with Europe. And some amount of ammonia, which is used in nitrogen-based fertilizers, and they mine a lot of potash, which is also used in fertilizers. Um, so they're important sources of those, and they are both the Ukraine and Russia are substantial wheat producers, and when they have good years, exporters. But there's traditionally a lot of variability and volatility in their uh, wheat crop production, so they're they're semi reliable in that regard, um, and they uh, very large production of platinum and palladium. They're chemical catalysts and mechanical catalysts. Your catalytic conversion, your cars. Um, typically have them, uh, and they're essential for uh, uh, petrol-based uh, vehicles. Uh, they produce a lot of neon, which go, is a very important, uh, actually, I think the number is 90% of the of, uh, world's neon production, which is essential for some semi semiconductors, comes out of uh, Europe. Um, so we have quite a bit of exposure to these things in our inflation hedge category, which we established uh, two, three years ago. So these developments or these commodities might be because of sanctions or anything else might become fairly important is actually good news uh, for uh, people, um, uh, clients of Versa. Uh, so I think uh, most recently, um, some of the events suggest that the end game here is to not necessarily to overrun the Ukraine and occupy it, it's to uh, disable or degrade some of the military capability in the installations. It's to surround or, uh, the capital, if not take the capital, all that would probably be very bloody for both sides. And um, a report out of Reuters uh, this morning um, suggests that uh, the Russians uh, Putin has agreed to organize negotiations uh, after Zelensky said he was ready to discuss neutrality. So Putin's big complaint on the surface is that he didn't want the Ukraine to be uh, become neutral. This morning, there are overtures to negotiate some sort of settlement, which would probably result in the Ukraine being just like uh, Belarus, kind of a vassal buffer state uh, with the West. Um, so I think what I've tried to convey is that uh, this is a big event from geopolitical, ethical, moral standards. It's not such a big economic event for the world. It might have implications because of sanctions and other things, uh, more so with Europe uh, than us here in the U.S., but uh, globally it could be. It could increase inflation because of uh, uh, tightening the supplies of commodities. Um, and that would be a good thing for us as investors. Uh, and um, uh, other than that, uh, we're going to keep an eye on things. If they change radically, um, we'll produce a further update for you. So thanks so much for spending time with us.
and I'm looking forward to seeing you all again in our next video update.